Good morning, everybody. Oh, come on. Good morning, everybody. All right. You guys are supposed to be awake for the first keynote. I heard the uh, second keynote tomorrow is kind of brutal after everybody gets to the casinos and gets a few things to drink and everything. So for today, you guys all need to be awake, and, uh, and we're going to have an exciting keynote here, lots of cool things to take a look at. As Rocky mentioned, uh, my name is James Conard. Um, I lead the technical evangelism efforts for Windows Azure at Microsoft. Basically what that means is I have a team of, of folks, evangelists, that go do a lot of things helping developers, helping you guys build applications with Windows Azure. Uh, so we do a lot of things in the community, a lot of the tutorials, samples, training kits you may see come out of the team. We go and present at a lot of the key conferences and community events, from the tech ed events to build conferences, um, even some of the local hackathons and dev camps that you may attend. Um, and we also just work very closely with a number of early adopters that are looking at using some of the latest Windows Azure services. So I'm really excited to be here today, fabulous Las Vegas, uh, bright and early this morning, and talk to you about what we've been doing with Windows Azure. In the next hour, what I want to do is take you on a tour of some of the key Windows Azure services and features. Now for some of you in this room, this may be a really quick introduction to allow you to get grounded and really be effective getting started building Azure apps. I recognize some of you in this room, though, have probably already started building or maybe have released several applications with Windows Azure over the last few years. But you may have noticed that we're on this incredibly fast pace with turning on new capabilities in the cloud. Literally every other week, there's something new that's lighting up within Windows Azure. So for you, I want you to see some of those key new features and services that you can take advantage of in your existing apps and some of the new apps that you have moving forward. If you haven't heard of Windows Azure, I'll give you a little bit of a high-level background. At a high level, you can really think of Windows Azure as Microsoft's cloud computing platform. What that means is it's really an environment where you can go deploy, run, and scale your applications, a wide variety of applications, as we'll see a little bit later. Over the last year, we've been focused on three core tenets within Windows Azure. The first is to ensure that Windows Azure is really flexible for running just a wide variety of applications and a wide variety of workloads. When we, Microsoft first introduced Windows Azure, we focused on this concept of platform as a service, providing a set of services that you could really turn on and that abstracted you from having to deal with hardware and networking and the underlying infrastructure. We're continuing to invest in that area and you're gonna see throughout this keynote several demos of how we're enhancing the platform as a service capabilities. But about a year ago, we also introduced our support for infrastructure as a service. What infrastructure as a service provides is the ability to get access to that underlying virtual machine environment, the underlying virtual networks, and more easily move some of the applications you have and give you even more flexibility. This combination of the ability to go combine both high-level platform services and the infrastructure together and compose solutions, we believe provides just an incredible amount of flexibility. We've also been focused on making sure that Windows Azure is very open. It allows you to go run applications that you would create using a variety of different frameworks, and using a variety of different tools, and even a variety of different operating systems, including both Linux, uh, Windows and Linux-based distributions. What you're going to see when it comes to flexibility, is, is also, um, and it comes to flexibility and openness, is also the ability for you to utilize open protocols. We've used a lot of open protocols wherever possible. So for example, our messaging service supports the AMQP protocol, so you can easily interoperate with Java-based clients. Our caching service supports MemcacheD protocol, so you can not only use the caching service from .NET-based applications, but also from applications you might write in Node or PHP. In fact, all of the services that you see in Windows Azure are exposed through simple, easy-to-consume REST-based APIs. And all of the SDKs that we've created, we've actually open sourced, put out in the community on GitHub, so you can take a look at the source code and maybe even change the source code as you need to for the solutions that you build. Finally, we're continuing to focus on making sure that we can provide a rock solid platform that you can build your applications on. And with that platform comes an SLA that you can depend on for, for the managed services that you want to consume. We believe that Azure is really going to be a differentiator and it's a pretty exciting time to be in this space and start using some of these services. As you get started with Azure, there's a few key concepts to understand. One of the first concepts I'll cover 
is a concept of regions. A region effectively defines where you can go run your code within Windows Azure. Today, we expose four regions in North America, two in Europe, and two in Asia. And in each of these regions, Microsoft runs and operates our own data centers that we surface through, through Windows Azure to you. That data center is simply something you can select as you go through, configure, and turn on services through the Azure Management Portal or through the APIs. And in these data centers, we're running tens, and in some cases, hundreds of thousands of servers that are available for you to go get access to. In addition to the regions where you can go run your code, we also support a number of what we call CDN edge endpoints. There's actually 26 of these at the last count. These are edge servers where you can cache content, like images, videos, scripts, and really deliver a better experience for some of your end users by caching that web-based content. And over the coming months, we're going to expand the footprint of our data center presence as well. So we have even more, more data centers for you to take advantage of. What this really means is the flexibility to go target other markets, not just having a US-based solution, but go reach out into Asia, into Europe, allowing you to have that, that global footprint as well. When you choose to deploy and run your code, you can obviously select a region, but also have the flexibility to move code from one region to another. In fact, with some of the services, you can even run in multiple regions at the same time and load balance and distribute your traffic based on your customers' demands. Another key concept that's really important to understand is how you consume services. This may be different for some of you that are coming from an environment where you have an on-premises infrastructure or where you've used a traditional kind of hosting provider. With Windows Azure, you only pay for the services that you consume. And what that means is you don't have to think about the upfront hardware cost, the upfront software licenses. Those are all included in the price of the services that you consume. When it comes to compute services, those are charged on a per hourly basis. And some of the higher level application services we'll look at have different pricing models depending on the service that gets exposed. So this provides just a lot of flexibility to run all types of different workloads. Even some kind of workloads that were just very difficult to go do in the past. Imagine the application that you want to spin up and only run for three or four weeks of the year, but it requires a massive amount of computing infrastructure, hundreds of servers, and, and terabytes of disk storage. That's incredibly hard to do today, to provision all that hardware infrastructure to go run those applications. With a Windows Azure-based model, you can spin that up and only pay for those services that you consume over that time period. So this provides a, a great amount of flexibility for the apps that you build. So now you understand some of these core tenets of Windows Azure. What I want to do is take you on a tour of some of the services and features and show you some of the new things we've been delivering in the platform as well. One of the key services I'll start with is Windows Azure Virtual Machines. I mentioned about a year ago we introduced our support for infrastructure as a service. And with that, we exposed both Windows and Linux-based distributions of operating systems that you could spin up within Windows Azure. With a virtual machine, you literally turn on the virtual machine, remote in and connect into the virtual machine, either via remote desktop or SSH, and you can install and configure whatever software you need to. If that's your code, if it's some controls and, and components that you've purchased from another third party, if it's some other legacy components that you have, that's software that you can go and install and configure within those, those virtual machines. In fact, what we expose is not only Windows and Linux-based distributions, but also a few different template-based virtual machines you can start with as well. So if you want to run SharePoint, that's an option for spinning up a VM. If you want to run SQL or even running BizTalk, there's virtual machine templates that you can use for starting to run those workloads on Windows Azure. These VM images are, are durable as well on the platform. Any changes you make within those instances are persisted as part of uh, the virtual machine. In addition to the virtual machine infrastructure, we're also providing support for virtual networking. And what the virtual network allows you to do, group, do is group together a set of those virtual machines as one network. So they can obviously see each other, talk to each other, and communicate. But it also allows you to extend those virtual machines that you provision in Windows Azure to your on-premises environment or to another hosting provider. In fact, making those cloud VM instances look like they're part of your own networking infrastructure. And so with that, what I want to do is actually show you a very quick demo of how to get started in Windows Azure and use virtual machines. You could go ahead and just switch over here. And here you can see I'm on a, on a, 
a demo machine here. And I'm starting with the windowsazure.com website. So on the windowsazure.com website, if you haven't visited the site, uh, you can actually just browse through a number of the key services that uh, I'm going to talk about today, websites, virtual machines, and more. Uh, drill in and view some of the details about the services. Of course, since all of you are developers here in this room, you can also navigate over to the documentation tab. And on the documentation tab, you can see the developer centers for mobile, for .NET, for the various languages and frameworks you might want to take advantage of. From there, you can download the SDKs, view the tutorials, and really start drilling into all of these uh, key services. We focused a lot on providing a lot of great content you can use and quickly get started with some of these services. Once you, uh, you've narrowed in on a few set of services that you might want to use, of course, you might want to look at some of the pricing information and understand that consumption-based model that I talked about. If you navigate over to the pricing calculator, you can see, for example, with virtual machines, they can specify a size for the virtual machine you want to create, where the size, uh, where the size actually impacts the amount of processor you have in terms of the number of cores, as well as the disk space and, and network I.O. as part of the VM. And you can also just use the slider and estimate the monthly cost for running those VMs. And you can see here a small instance starts at eight cents per hour to just start up a virtual machine instance. Once you've uh, picked some services you want to use, you can get started with the free trial. Um, if you haven't signed up for Windows Azure today, uh, I encourage you to go get started with a free trial where you can see there's a number of resources and services that are exposed as part of this trial. I imagine many of you in this room are actually MSDN subscribers. So if you go back over here to member offers, you'll notice that MSDN subscribers can get up to $3,700 worth of benefits to, uh, to Windows Azure as part of your MSDN subscription. So it's definitely something I encourage you to take advantage of. Once you've created a Windows Azure account, you can navigate over to the Azure Management Portal. And so I've already created an account, and I'm logged in here uh, with my, uh, my Microsoft account. And so I'm browsing over to the Azure Management Portal. Here you can see that from the Azure Management Portal, I have a simple HTML-based experience for managing and accessing all of the Windows Azure services. This, this web-based experience is something I can use, of course, from Windows, but I can also go use from a variety of other client platforms as well. If I want to access this from an iPad or from a phone, that's something I can also bring up and configure and manage some of these services. You'll notice that as I navigate through each of the services, there's some common, uh, common menu structure here where I can quickly and easily provision and turn on additional services. Let's go ahead and get started here with virtual machines. With VM, what I want to do here is I'll create a new virtual machine, go down to the new menu, and you see under the compute the various compute options that are available. I can do a quick create and just provide a DNS name, pick the image that I want to get started with, the size of the VM, enter a, user, enter a password, and just get started provisioning that VM. I can also go into the gallery and see a variety of those virtual machine templates that I described earlier, Windows and Linux-based distributions. I'll go ahead and pick the Windows Server 2012. <music>